Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with Amanda DeKean, who has worked in healthcare and health care administration for the last 25 years in California, Canada, Australia, and other places. She's been active since 2003 in supporting uh, state-level uh, health care reform in New Mexico uh, and has made presentations on Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act uh, or the a ACA uh, uh, to many organizations in the state. She's also the president of the board of New Mexico Health Connections, a consumer-oriented uh, and operated plan that was funded through Obamacare in 2012. With the Republicans in Congress voting fruitlessly again for the 38th and 39th time to repeal Obamacare this week, and with the health insurance marketplace starting up in New Mexico on October 1st, we thought it was a good time to get some basic clarity about Obamacare and how it will affect all New Mexicans. And Nanda DeKean is the perfect person to help us. We are so glad to have you here today. Thank you so much for coming into our library. Thank you for having me. Um, this is a big issue for all of us, and it's an issue I'm very um, serious about and supportive of. Um, it's a good question, you know, why do we support um, the health reform process, or why should we support right. the health reform process? And there are people who uh, want to repeal it and, and so on and so forth. But I think we've got to take a look at and understand the fact that doing nothing became unsustainable, that the costs of the system are extraordinary and were slated to go through the roof. Yeah. So there had been a number of analyses that said, for example, that if we did absolutely nothing, uh, the costs of our system would increase by $2 trillion by 2020. Two so trillion. Two trillion. Oh. Doing absolutely nothing, leaving our system continue in its merry way, it would have gone from two point something trillion to four point something trillion. Oh. So it was clearly unsustainable. GDP as a percentage of our gross domestic product, health would have taken, leapt up from about 18% where it is now, which is already too high, yeah. to 20%. So right. one out of every $5 would have gone to pay for healthcare, squeezing out things like education and so on. And then our, um, the, the, the uninsured would rise um, from around 49,000 in 49 million, mm -hmm. what am I saying, in 2010 to over 67 million. Mm -hmm. And what happens when, six, when people get uninsured in that great numbers is that everyone's cost rises. So in terms of looking at this and saying, uh, you know, what does this do to our economy? It, it just is absolutely horrific to have this number of people uh, only using emergency rooms which are already overstretched and stretched beyond their means. There's a human cost as well. In addition to all these other costs we've talked about, um, there's a human cost to, to this whole scene. So the Institute of Medicine did a study uh, in 2002 that said 18,000 people die in our country every year from lack of insurance because they don't have coverage. That number was updated by another urban, I think the Urban Institute, by 2008, by which the numbers had gone up to 25,000. Yes. And more recently, um, a group of Harvard um, professors uh, wrote a paper that said the, the, the original studies had only looked at the direct impact of connection between no insurance. And these people also looked at the indirect influence of having no insurance. In other words, people max out their eligibility um, kind of is goes by the wind when they run up millions of dollars in debt. Mm -hmm. They can't get any more care because they don't have any more money, even if they're insured. So um, they put the number closer to 45,000 oh people each year. So who there die? isn't, this is yeah. who die from not having health care. Mm -hmm. So even if you know, I mean, there are a lot of us who care about that, the human cost, as I call it. But if 
You didn't even worry about that. The cost to our health system, providers don't get paid if people aren't insured. Hospitals don't get paid. All of this feeds into our health costs because premiums, I mean, the estimate is, uh, the, the most recent study on it said for a family of four are paying over $2,000 of their premium in the costs of caring for the uninsured. So the cost of premiums was due to go from, it's already, I think, very high, over $12,000 for a family of four, that's $1,000 a month, yeah. to, uh, it was it, in, um, by 2020, it would go up, the, the lowest estimate is $19,000 for a family of four to $26,000 oh, for yes. a family of four. So <sighs> when you put all of that in together, doing nothing was not an option. And so Obamacare became uh, something that the Congress, the Democrats were interested in. And, uh, you know, we, we all supported the concept that something had to happen. And it came to pass, thank goodness. We all know that New Mexico is now the poorest state in the union. Uh, we have uh, tremendous health care deficits, we have many, many uninsured people. What has Obamacare so far uh, done for the people of New Mexico? Yes, that's a good question. So just a quick word about the uninsured in New Mexico. We've talked about national numbers, but there's we have next to Texas the second highest proportion of our population who are uninsured. In wow. addition to being extremely poor, you know, the median income is very low. Uh, the, we have a, almost 25 uh, percent. Some people would say 23, but roughly 420 to 440 thousand people who have no insurance. Oh and what we need to understand again is that. Um, the the Office of Healthcare Reform actually commissioned a survey of people who were uninsured a few years ago and discovered that more than half, uh, so these were people, they, they talked to over 700 people, and these, about more than half were employed, and 25% of them were, were working full-time year-round. So we have a system which we didn't want to materially change. We didn't want to get away from the employer-based healthcare system. And, but employers don't have to provide insurance. And a lot of our insured are not bums, as a lot of people assume. They're working hard. Yes. So many of them are seasonal. Many of them work in low-paying jobs. A lot of them are working full-time. So, you know, there's the, the advantage, the biggest advantage that New Mexico is going to get from Obama is the business of covering people, providing affordable coverage to the group who are working and to also provide subsidies to, and through expanded Medicaid to cover people who are living uh, under, you know, earning very, very minimal amounts, 138% uh, uh, of poverty, lev poverty level. So it's a very, very um, important uh, overall uh, contribution to uh, the state. Uh, it, it takes away the, the drain of the resources from our providers and it puts money back in their pockets to treat uh, people properly. So um, what have we got in other terms, in sort of tangible benefits? So the law went into effect, and in, parts of it went into effect actually in 2010, even though it wasn't, you know, it, the, most of it, the insurance pieces of it won't come in until January of this year. So when it kicked started after the law was passed in 2010, children were the first beneficiaries. So children could be covered until age 26 on their parents' insurance. So that's a big deal because these are kids in college. These are kids who are training to be good members of the workforce. If they can't manage their health care uh, while they're going through those uh, um, those educational years, it's, it would have been harder on them. Definitely. So that was the that was a big thing. And um, there were no denials of coverage for pre-existing conditions. Right. So, so the whole, yeah, there's a whole issue around, um, you know, changes that were made to insurance uh, that we can talk about later. Yes. But this was, this kick started for children. Seniors last year, 
um, received uh, the the bonus of um, some major um, offsets of their prescription benefits, and uh, twenty thousand seniors actually uh, got rebates uh, mm. from uh, from the prescription changes in the prescription medication. And uh, over 200,000 will benefit from the closing of the donut hole over time. That started last year. But even more important, and, and a lot of seniors started feeling it last year, that um, they could access one wellness visit and preventive services for very specific conditions that are recommended for people of that age with no co-pays and deductibles. Okay, so the benefit to that, of course, is problems get identified early and we're not paying for treatment when stuff is way down the road and much more expensive. You're investing in the health of seniors early and this will be a good thing for them and for the costs of Medicare down the road. So those were two benefits that were kickstarted last year, uh, last year for seniors. In addition, there's been almost $168 million that came into the state as of last year wow. for various things. People are focused on the health insurance exchange, which they should be because it's the most tangible um, part of it. But in addition to changing insurance, this law also understands the need to ramp up providers and to create a wider infrastructure. So over $30 million to community health centers who are caring for the uninsured, who will now become insured, and hopefully they can get access uh, to care for uh, to a wider, they can give access to care for a wider number of people. School-based health centers received both capital as well as operational dollars around $6 million. Oh. $5 million came into the state for home visiting services for uh, people, for young mothers. We've got a very, very high teen birth rate yeah. in New Mexico. That's an investment in getting a healthy child and a healthy mother off to a good start. Mm -hmm. So these kinds of investments have come in in a big way. Loan forgiveness for working in rural areas, for example, was initiated. Providers are willing to work outside in, in rural and underserved areas get more money under Medicaid after this law than they would, uh, was passed, than they had in the past. Um, they've also bolstered education and workforce training to bring more, uh, for example, nurses into nurse practitioner roles and so widen the scope of primary care reach through having additional workforce expansion. Training a physician is going to take, by the time, if you doubled your medical school, getting them out into the community is 12 years. Yeah. So they've, they've actually done some very interesting and intelligent things about, you know, quickly ramping up um, ways in which uh, primary care can be provided today in, in rapidly. And um, so they funded pilot projects um, for various innovative care. In fact, two of our organizations in New Mexico got over $30 million apiece. One is the New Mexico uh, Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. McInerney's group got um, uh, to develop a cancer home uh, wow. where uh, they, would, uh, they would make sure pa patients didn't get admitted to hospital unnecessarily uh, over the weekend and evening hours and so on, mm -hmm. which uh, would save the system a ton of money. Yeah. And ECHO, uh, the, the, the kind of community outcomes uh, group from the university, got another $30 million to help with the most complex, most which are also the most expensive patients uh, in a different, using a team approach and using outpatient intensive teams, for wow. example. So we've we've made a, a lot of money. I haven't given you, I haven't scratched the surface of the full gambit that universities have benefited, healthcare providers have benefited, and then Medicaid expansion. It It is absolutely amazing to me that we had to think about whether to accept that <laughs> money or not. I mean, uh, it brings it brings coverage to a group of people who've never had coverage before. And it also 
uh, the government pays 100% for three years. And some economists, um, the Voices for Children, have papers on their website that point out that, um, you know, the state, through its contract with MCOs, gets to keep 4% of all these premium incomes. And that goes directly into the state's general coffers wow. from this. And, and we think that's going to be close to $600 million of money that we wouldn't have we wouldn't if we have. didn't take the expansion money. And there are no ties to that. They can, they can do things. The state can use that money to do things that they otherwise wouldn't have money for. So there's a lot of... And then local communities, imagine uh, healthcare providers ramping up additional healthcare providers in rural and, and small towns being able to expand their hours of care, they can actually bill for these patients. Wonderful. And that's going to be, they pay gross receipts tax, they can they contribute to the economy. Um, you know, local towns and businesses uh, will, will uh, benefit from this. So I don't have an exact number of all of uh, the jobs that will be created, but the estimates are, you know, in the tens of thousands of new, new jobs that will be created. And healthcare jobs are usually good paying jobs. Right. So I think it would be good now after this, this wonderful uh, uh, clarity about exactly how much we've benefited already to try and understand certain terminologies, which I think are a little confusing to people. I know that there's, uh, there's a health insurance m marketplace, and it's also called an exchange. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a role and a responsibility for the superintendent of insurance, but I don't have any idea what that might be. Mm -hmm. And I also know that we've already talked a little bit about Medicaid expansion, but I'd love us to get into those three rather technical areas and see if we can explain them to... Um, people like me <laughs> we need all the help I can get mm -hmm. thank you yes well that is the the most exciting part of what's coming forward in New Mexico uh, starting October 1 the state will have a health insurance exchange so the health insurance exchange or the health insurance marketplace as it's called is a place for <coughs> people who need insurance who don't have insurance or who would like to change their insurance to get affordable coverage in addition, the exchange is the place where uh, federal subsidies are made available for people uh, to help offset the cost of their health insurance plan. Mm. So if your income is above 138%, but up to 400% of the federal poverty level, um, you are entitled to receive help um, under the, the rules of the exchange. Uh, and that, it'll be less subsidy the more your income, but what it does do is make sure you're not paying more than 9.5% of your income in premiums. Yeah. So, I mean, there are people who think that's too high, but that's the line at which affordability has been drawn. So, um, you know, part of what is happening right now, the superintendent, you mentioned you asked about him. Yeah. The superintendent, of course, has a role to play in the exchange. But the exchange is governed by a board, and he is a member of the exchange okay. board. But the superintendent plays a much bigger role um, as the superintendent of insurance because he has actually been ramping up uh, another part of our government that's been uh, preparing for um, the, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. He's the one that has to certify that plans sold on the exchange are qualified health plans. Uh -huh. Okay, so you can't sell on the exchange unless you meet certain criteria, certain, certain federal criteria. Uh -huh. So he makes absolutely sure they can do that. In addition, by the way, and this isn't hasn't much to do with the exchange, but it has to do with the superintendent's new role, he also has the right to challenge. He can't set rates, okay? I want to make that really clear. Yeah. But he can challenge and ask for explanations for rate increases, wow. which, you know, couldn't do in the past. Right. And uh, he is now, you know, he has the authority to do that. Wow. But... Uh, coming back to the exchange, so the exchange will have two components to it. One is called the shop, which is the employer, the small employer 
uh, coverage option. And that is where uh, employers with 50 employees or less can come in and get their employees signed up and they get tax credits towards their premium costs. Mm -hmm. For They actually could have done it starting two years ago and they get it for four consecutive years and the tax credits go up to 50% when, once the exchange is functioning. Mm -hmm. So there's a financial incentive to buy on the exchange and for employees to cover their employees um, for the really small employers. Individuals who don't have insurance and don't are either working for themselves, like I was for many years, um, can also purchase through the exchange and are entitled to both subsidies and to premium tax credits. I don't mean to interrupt, but I am I'm always been a little confused. Mm -hmm. So what this means is, is that, let's say I go and I want to, I want to change my insurance mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. I can go to the exchange or the marketplace, and mm -hmm. and there will be a number of companies there mm -hmm. yes. with their proposals and their perspective yes. and all the rest that I can choose from. Yes, actually, that's a very good point. Um, so if you think about buying an airline tickets and ticket and you go on Priceline or Orbitz or something like that, you should be able to put in where you want to go, how much you're willing to pay, and you get a comparative list of plans right. that meet your needs. We have five insurance plans that have uh, put in their intention to sell on the exchange. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've got five, and again, as a condition of selling on the exchange, the superintendent has required that at least, plans have to offer at least one plan that's sold statewide. So you can't just sell in the Albuquerque market or just sell in the, in the big urban markets. You have to be able to cover, you know what, how rural and frontier we are and yeah. our, Residents in, in rural New Mexico have had a very tough time. Um, so, and I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, New Mexico Health Connections, the co-op, uh, which you mentioned earlier, yeah. which, by the way, is another um, thing we would not have, a not-for-profit health insurance plan in New Mexico if it hadn't been for the Affordable right. Care Act. So we will be one of five selling on the exchange, um, and the prices are being vetted right now by the superintendent. Mm. He can challenge your prices if he thinks they're uh, off. He can't, again, set prices, but he can ask what the assumptions are. And uh, um, coming in September, I think, is when the final rates will be published. If everything goes uh, exactly according to plan, and we all know that that's probably a little bit of a hope and a whisper here, but you can, you should be able to go in and select from a range of plans that meet your particular needs. Uh, for where you live, you, you get a chance to do that in a way that nobody has had a chance to do That'd till now. It would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. Oh. In addition, understanding that people who've never had healthcare before will have trouble and by the way, a huge population benefit for uh, New Mexicans is the Native American community that have never had to purchase insurance in the past and still don't, are not required to purchase insurance even through the individual mandate. Mm -hmm. They have the opportunity to buy private insurance if they choose um, mm -hmm. under, under this new law. So you have, we've got... Um, the, these insurance plans that will be selling on the exchange. So the the differences between what was and was and is now is that you should have very simple, easy to use uh, tools. The exchanges are also going to do a lot of outreach and be hiring people who can help with this. Now, the model here. Remember, all of this is, we do have, actually, a functioning exchange. We have more than one. But the model that the law used to develop its framework was the Massachusetts exchange. Oh. And when it opened, um, in, you know, there was, there was a lot of concern about it. And it has actually morphed very nicely yeah. into, into covering 
um, a, you know, there's a f- only um, the, in single digits. The uninsured in, in Massachusetts right now is in the single digits. Wow. So, you know, we would be very lucky to get that low. But even having our uninsured rate would be great. Mm-hmm. So um, the benefits, again, under the new laws are that there'll be no denials for pre-existing conditions for everyone starting 2014. Um, there will be no, if you've been a good faith purchaser and have been paying into your premiums all the time, all, all uh, through, uh, then you can't max out your benefits if you have a catastrophic illness. You know, so people don't go bankrupt as a consequence of bills um, that come through. Um, there are limits on co-pays and deductibles. I can't give you an exact dollar amount because it's complicated. Um, but there are protections to individuals that purchase uh, insurance. So we've got a lot of the the problems with the old system fixed. And so, you know, we hope under this new system, um, when people do get covered for health care, uh, they too, are the average health insurance plan, has to provide preventive care with no co-pays and deductibles. So if I need my influencer shot, and, you know, it's a community benefit for me to get it because yeah. then I'm not going to go around spreading the flu because I've, I've taken the shot. And uh, vaccinations for kids all and for adults who need them. I mean, all of this is covered, the preventive services um, so there's a there's a whole host of benefits that to which insurance plans cannot link a copay Wonderful. and deductible. Yeah. So it's actually I know people think oh it's so confusing, but it's actually a well thought out law. It's looked at sort of the investment op- uh, opportunities for population health in in terms of prevention. It's rewarding the system for early detection because they'll pay you. Mm-hmm. to to do the right thing and and it's covering you to get the care you need when you need it so uh you know that those benefits ought to be realized over time obviously initially there will be a spike because so many people have never had a doctor and right. never had care that there will be a spike in both costs and in problems but the expectation is once their problems get managed, then there'll be fewer blips in the system, fewer uses of the emergency room for things that are preventable. Now, I forgot to ask you one other question okay. about, about something that I've heard called the no wrong door. Mm-hmm. What does that actually mean? Yes, that's a very important piece of what the exchange is meant to do. And the law actually requires uh, the exchange exchange to say that if someone comes in, and remember most people don't know uh, how to apply for insurance, and they fill out their forms, they fill out their income information, and the exchange, the people that are doing this at the exchange discover that you're actually not making enough money, well, you're making so little money that you are probably entitled to apply for Medicaid um, or vice versa. You come in thinking you're qualified for Medicaid, find out uh-uh, you're earning a little too much. Uh, you are supposed to be um, assisted into one or the other of those programs oh. so that there's there's a there's not this business of uh, our current system saying, give them a call, here's the phone number. You should have some way of a warm handoff th- so that you are talking. There's some kind of a uh, smooth transition for you because you've provided all the information. You shouldn't have to repeat that information and somebody should be able to pick up on what the exchange took from you and and act on it and put you into the right slot. It's a very, very nice way of making sure people don't turn around and leave the application process and not come back and stay uninsured. I know many times in my life I've filled out forms the wrong way mm-hmm. and I had to go back to the back of the line. It was not I much know. fun. Yeah. There there's, seems to be as well a whole, um, a whole galaxy of 
myths and fears and panics about Obamacare. Um, one of them is, is that is that you're going to actually be forced to have health insurance. <laughs> Could you talk about that a little bit? Actually, Barrett, that is not a myth. <laughs> that, 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 that happens to be a very, very basic requirement in the law, and I'll, I'll explain it in a minute. So this is the point on which uh, the law was, t- was uh, heard. Uh, one of the points on which the law was heard in uh, the Supreme Court is that uh, the federal government didn't have the right to force people to buy health insurance. And the reality is, if people, if everyone didn't opt in to health insurance, only sick people would buy health insurance. And, oh. and that would not uh, be a sustainable system. We would lose uh, this whole reform process immediately. And the second thing about illness is that no one plans for it. Um, it's always inconvenient. Yes. It is never at the severity that you like. Um, it's not controllable. So um, accidents happen which put people in hospital um, way earlier than they ever expected to be in hospital, um, often for months at a time. So uh, the, whole, the whole idea of um, having what they call the individual responsibility in the law, which has been called the individual mandate, is that people should be insured and should buy insurance before they need uh, to access health care. Um, now, there are a small number of groups that uh, are exempt from this mandate. I think I mentioned Native Americans right. earlier. They are not covered by the mandate. And there are uh, some religious exemptions which are still being worked through. So, but other than that, And people can put in if they absolutely, with all of the safeguards that are in the system, if you're very poor and marginally uh, employed, you can go on Medicaid. Um, If that doesn't work for you, you can go on the exchange and get subsidies. But if there is something about your situation that defeats all of these exigencies that have been created, uh, you can still apply for an exemption uh, to the individual Uh. mandate. Uh, But you really have to, the IRS has to approve that before you can not be assessed penalties. Um, You'll be assessed a very small penalty in year one. Uh, Just to remind you that you are one of these people that haven't bought insurance. But those penalties rise until your penalty is equal to the cheapest bronze plan on the exchange. So you'll be the equivalent of purchasing insurance. Now, again, I come back to the Massachusetts experience because Massachusetts instituted a mandate and everyone had to buy insurance. And there were people who started out saying, I'm not going to do it. I'll pay the penalty. That's fine, but I'm not going to buy health insurance. And in fact, the number, the numbers of people without who chose not to buy health insurance has halved in Mm. in Massachusetts. So maybe they sat out year one and they sat out year two, but eventually they do have to go to doctors. They have to get a test done, and they have to get some help for which they end up paying a check. And it's never as cheap. Um, it's never as satisfying as knowing your insurance uh, will cover it. So that's not a that's not a myth, uh-huh. but it's a good thing for the society as a whole. I think. So um, we've come a long way now in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think. Many things are much clearer to me, thank heavens. I think you've done a beautiful job here. But there must be a number of particularly galling myths Mm -hmm. that get bandied about Mm -hmm. uh, that actually undermine this very useful process Mm -hmm. uh, that we're about to enter into here. Could you uh, could you elucidate on one or two of the ones that are the most galling? Well, there are so many. I mean, if they weren't so serious, I would think they were funny kind of stories going around with uh, the Affordable Care Act. And uh, the opponents have done a great job of making this um, making this uh, um, really frightening people is what they've done. 
Um, one of the one of the major pieces that I think um, that still kind of floats up occasionally is that this is a government takeover of healthcare, and that's okay. been the biggest fight on the part of uh, Republicans uh, because they would rather um, to you know repeal the law than than have what they call a government takeover of healthcare. But as we've seen, this is actually and and because they say, um, you know, the government is going to come between you and your doctor. But but really, if you take a look at the system that existed, it was insurance that came between you and your doctor. Ah, uh, yes. And this law actually stops that because when doctors don't have to call an insurance company to figure out if they can treat a pre-existing condition, okay. that is the law enabling treatment not coming in between which an insurance plan did in the past you could not doctors couldn't order certain tests on their patients uh, and sometimes very uh, extremely normal and commonplace tests without getting the permission from an insurance company representative who often was not a clinician and they could be turned down, okay? And and I understand that all of us need to make sure that, you know, tests don't go skyrocketing. We're talking about um, very responsible physicians uh, being told. In, in other words, every, every physician was treated like they're going to abuse the system, and so everyone had to call in instead of targeting only those who may maybe order more tests than they should. So this system allows that second um, opportunity to work out. So nobody gets between the physician and the decision to treat a patient um, in, in, in quite that egregious a manner as before. So that was, you know, the government is, has been an enabler in this regard. And it's always amusing to me when they say, in in addition to that, say hands off my Medicare, which right, is right, right, right. which is nothing but a wonderful uh, government managed um, benefit for all of us who are over sixty five, right. and I couldn't wait to get on Medicare actually, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think it's that's been a myth um, that that needs to be debunked very very fast. Nanity, thank you so very much for for clearing up so many of these strange cobwebs and and uh, ghoulish things. I I really think that um, that now that we've heard this, I think we're gonna all of us are gonna have a have an easier time trying to read the papers and understand what these terms mean and exactly what the overall picture is. I'm very grateful that you were here and 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 I'm very grateful that you were so lucid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for asking me. Thank you.